Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala al-ma'uthi rahmatil al-alameen. Nabiyyina wa habibina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim amma ba'd. Al-yawm, sab'a min shahr rabi'i al-thani, alfa arba'umia wa athnan wa arba'oon. Al-muafiq li thalatha wa shiroon, li thalatha wa shiroon min shahr November, alfayn wa shiroon. نواصل درسنا في هذا الكتاب المبارك والدواء نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يبارك في مؤلفه وأن يغفر له ويرفع درجته في عليين وأن يبارك فيما تعلمنا ونتعلم In the continuation of what we have started with which is the discussion on the pillar of العبادة الخوف uh, so that people will not depend on the raja only, you know. And as I always mention, the intention of this uh, chapter is to make, uh, is to help a believer to maintain the uh, the balance, you know, in whatever we do, to maintain the balance in whatever we're doing, uh, instead of depending on uh, on khauf or raja, we have both of them when we deal with uh, matters of. Uh, ibadah or uh, aspect of life uh, in all of its forms. So uh, uh, the next hadith which is supposed to be the beginning of the dars today is the hadith of uh, Abdullah ibn Umar found in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad which is uh, also authentic uh, insha'Allah. Yaqul al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam من تعظم في نفسه أو اختال في مشيته لقي الله تعالى وهو عليه قضمان سبحان الله يعني whoever raise up himself and he thinks he is so big he makes himself so big it's referring to a kibriya a person thinks he is so great so big you know so important in in a way others are in a lower position than him that's the kabbal wal kibriya. So whoever shows arrogance in his life and ikhtalafi mashiti or ikhtalafi mashiti or he walks uh, uh, arrogantly, you know, he walks arrogantly. Laqi Allah ta'ala wa hu alayhi kadhban. He's going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be angry with him. Awudhu billah. Subhanallah. So uh, from this we learn that uh, arrogance is prohibited Islamically and subhanallah if you look at it uh, properly it doesn't fit human being you know arrogance doesn't fit human being at all it doesn't fit human being if that is something which is supposed to be arrogant it should be something that is perfect and we don't have this perfection on anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's only perfect with no deficiency no mistake no error Perfect in every aspect, you know. So that's the only one who has the right uh, to be arrogant. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-Izzu ridai, Izari, wal kibriya ridai. Fa man naza'ani fihi ma shay an azabtuhu, you know. These are my two garments, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And whoever mix with me, you know, try, try and share with me in this uh, garment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will def definitely punish him. Arrogance, you know, to be like somebody who nobody can tell you, you do whatever you want. This is the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Allah is fa'alu lima yurid. La yus'alu amma yafad. La mu'akkiba li hukmi. When he decides, nobody can come and check and see uh, whether it is correct or, or wrong. That's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this attribute. So as I said, arrogance doesn't fit a human being. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rejected it and the Quran rejected it. You get an idea? Uh, mountains, if the, you have something to be arrogant, mountains they should be arrogant actually. But they're not. They're always humble, you know, in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why when the Jew, they became so arrogant, you know, so bad in their manners and attitude, and they rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after knowing the fact. You know, you go and read Surah Al-Baqarah, you see all of these, you know, much more than what I'm telling you now. 
they did a lot against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and against their pro, uh, his prophets. Allah says, ثُمَّ قَسَرْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَهِيَ كَالْحِجَارَةِ أَوْ أَشَدُ قَسْوَىٰ The heart of the Jew became like the rock. And even harder than the rock, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Why is that? He says, وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْحِجَارَةِ لَمَا يَتَفَجَّرُ مِنْهُ الْأَنْهَارِ وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَشَّقَّقُ فَيَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ الْمَاءِ وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَهْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, because you can have a rock that is penetrated, you know, by the water. Sometimes you will cut into pieces so that water can penetrate it and come out. And sometimes you find a rock, you know, removing itself from its position, falling down to the ground out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the heart of a Jew is not like that, you know. And rock, they're so arrogant and it was so, you know, up to date you never heard of, okay, I, at least I never heard of a situation whereby when a hurricane comes, you know, it moves the, the mountain from its position to another location. We have seen in Japan uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, you know, when the, the, the tsunami happened, you know, we see aeroplane, according to the pictures that uh, were shown to us, we see, we saw uh, aeroplanes in the middle of the city, you know. Houses are gone, everything that could be taken by the wind was gone, you know. SubhanAllah. But uh, we don't have any information about rocks or mountains, mountains being uh, uh, displaced, you know, from their position. They're so solid, so firm, and Allah SWT used them as a peg for the earth, you know. But they are not arrogant, you know. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا Don't you ever walk on earth arrogantly. إِنَّكَ لَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضَ وَلَن تَبْلُغَ الْجِبَالَ طُولَا Because you will never walk, and at the same time we see the sign of your walking, you know, you, you're breaking the earth, into, the earth into pieces when you walk. It should be like that. If you're so arrogant, it should be like that. When you walk, even the, the earth is getting affected, you know. We don't see that. That means the earth is more solid than you. It can accommodate you. It can accept you. It can help you to move on it. And it is not arrogant. Allah subhanahu wa says, وَلَن تَبْلُغَ الْجِبَالَ طُولًا And you will never reach the height of a mountain. They mentioned that Tufan, when it came, you know, it covers the mountain. The mountains, you know. Allah says, إِنَّا لَمَّا تَغَلْ مَا أُحَمَلْنَكُمْ فِي الْجَهْرِيَا the water is so high, you know. Now, Taga is arrogant, you know. But that means it's cross all the boundaries. That's how powerful is the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he is angry and the anger is manifested on earth, things like this will take place. You know? So back to the arrogance. As I said, brothers and sisters, without going into much detail, Wallahi, you know, oxymulakum billah. There is nothing better for all of us more than the tawadu, humility and humbleness. Be humble throughout your life. You don't need to show who you are. You don't need to oppress anyone. You know, be humble and people will see this humility and they will raise you up. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا تَوَضَعَ أَحَدٌ لِلَّهِ إِلَّا رَفَعَهُ Nobody will be uh, humble for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise him in and elevate him in ranking. So cool down, my brothers and sisters. Cool down, cool down, cool down. No matter how much knowledgeable you are, no matter how much you have of uh, position, you know, cool down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you up. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah awha ilayya an tawadaru hatta la yafkhara ahadun ala ahad. وَلَا يَبْغِيَ أَحَدٌ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٌ He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to me, you know, as a command for all uh, human beings, and to others, that everyone should be humble, so that nobody is dealing with another person arrogantly. If you're looking for humbleness, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best example you have. He, Allah, he has all the qualities that can make him and it's so arrogant if he wish, but he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like this. He plays with the kids. We don't have time to play with the kids. He says salam to everyone. 
they were mentioned to us that Rasulullah when he meets people, they should begin with the salam, but he began with the salam. You know, that's how humble was Rasulullah They mentioned to us that a slave will come and hold the hand of Rasulullah and drag him to whatever, wherever she wants to go, you know. SubhanAllah, that's Rasulullah He is to listen to a person who is speaking to him in the way that person will believe that he is the best amongst the companions of the Prophet And nowadays, somebody will tell you, no, I'm very busy. 24 hours, I have no time, you know. And sometimes even you say salam to somebody just because he think, you know, I put it in this way intentionally, he think he's a scholar, but he doesn't have time to reply your salam with smile. Blind with angry face. Why? They might tell you they are not. They are not. They are not free. You know. Ya khair Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the busiest person you can ever uh, hear about in your life. Twenty-four hours you can say Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was busy, but he has time to say salam. He has time to visit people. Even kuffar also next to him, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when they are sick, if they are his neighbor, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam visit some of them. So the, our best example is Rasulullah. Like you have 24 hours in a day. You don't have, you cannot squeeze a few seconds to say salam to people. And what do, you, what, do you, what do you lose if you smile? What do you lose if you show humbleness? You know? Somebody told me that this, this is showing, I mean, acceptance and smiling to people. This is the attitude of the mutasawwifin, of Sufiya. He said, only Sufiya does that. I was like, subhanallah. Rasulullah is advising us to do something and then we are saying that we don't see it with anyone except in specific group of people, whoever they are. Wallahi, this is very unfortunate, you know, in the Ummah of Muhammad that you look for these attitudes and manners, you don't see them, you know. What happened to the Ummah? Allahumma stand. We detach ourselves to the Sunnah of the Prophet in the way the Sunnah of the Prophet became strange. So let's revive our religion, you know. Reviving our religion doesn't mean you bring something new. No, religion doesn't accept anything new. Or every single thing has been done for us. Whatever you need to pass the test in this life, the scholars have exposed it to us. The sunnah of the Prophet wasallam is very clear. So all that you have to do, you know, is to go back to Rasulullah through his hadith and the sunnah and take the way Rasulullah used to live, live in that way. At Tawadu, you know, subhanAllah. Until today, whenever I read this hadith of the Prophet uh, when the Prophet says, Inni la akulu muttakiya. Allah, I found it so interesting, you know. That's the peak of humility and humbleness. He said, Inni la akulu muttakiya. He said, I don't eat while lying on the ground. You know, the muttaki means to lie down on your side, you know, put your hand like this. You know. He says, I don't eat like that. Because this is the method of the arrogant people. You know what he says? He says, Innama akulu kama akulu abd. Allahu Akbar. He said, I eat just like the way a slave eats. And go and see the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sit down and he eats. SubhanAllah, the most interesting, even the way when you look at, you know, when you look at it, SubhanAllah, it's so interesting, you know. It shows humbleness, it shows kindness, it shows adab, you know. That's what we're taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, even in eating the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's very more adab, you know. That's why if a person is to criticize Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam concerning the matter of adab, I guess his friend from the kuffar are going to are going to refute him. The Muslim doesn't need to say anything because uh, this is a very clear area, you know. You can't touch Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it comes to that. So let's uh, observe this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and become mutawadin. If whoever hears this, I really urge you to extend this to others. Whenever you see somebody who is a Muslim and being arrogant, remind him about this. And he's going to lose. And what is waiting for him on the day of judgment if he doesn't repent might be worse. You know. In this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deprive him from learning. Allah says, سَأَصْرِفُ عَنْ آيَاتِيَ الَّذِينَ يَتَكَبَرُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ Those who are showing arrogance, you know, against the ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the arrogant people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَأَصْرِفُ عَنْ آيَاتِيَ الَّذِينَ يَتَكَبَرُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ 
those mutakabirin, Allah says, I will not let them see the truth. I will not let them learn. SubhanAllah. That's really, really one of the, 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 the harshest punishment that a person receives in this life. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to let you see the truth. SubhanAllah. How do you survive that? You know? So let's be very careful. Let's be very careful. Uh, don't be arrogant in your life. You know? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنْ يَرُوا كُلَّ آيَةِ لَا يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَا so imagine you will reach a, a, a situation, no matter how much somebody tries to show you the truth, you will never believe in that. You know. Why is that? Because you are arrogant. You know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us, grant us good. And uh, what is arrogance? It's good for us also to, to talk about the arrogance itself. What is arrogance? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked by the companions, they said, Ya Rasulullah, but one of us likes his, to see his shoes clean, you know, wearing the nice and neat cloth, you know. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, this is not arrogance. In Allah Jamilun Yihibbu Al-Jamaat. He says, Al-Kibru Batru Al-Haqqi Wa Ghamtu Al-Nas. Al-Kibru Batru Al-Haqqi Wa Ghamtu Al-Nas. He says, arrogance is not you uh, wearing something good, you know, dressing in a good way. This is not arrogance. He says, Al-Kibru Batru Al-Nasi Batru Al-Haqqi Wa Ghamtu Al-Nas. Rejection of the truth. That's the arrogance. Rejection of the truth. You reject the truth when you see it. You know, there are some people, no matter how much you try to, I mean, uh, uh, d d expose the truth to them, they will never accept it. You know, they see it, they know, but they don't want it from you. You know, imagine somebody, I told him, it took Allah, he said, I don't want, you know. Yeah, I, I met this kind of mentality, you know, in Medina Rasulillah, you know, inside the Masjid of Rasulillah. I told somebody, Taqillah, he said, I don't want it. He wants to hear it from somebody else, he said. Okay. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and him. So, Al-Kibru, Battur Al-Haqqi, Wa Ghamtu Al-Nas. The second part of the definition of Kibru is disrespecting others. It's looking at others with the lower eyes. You know. Lower eyes means the eyes of disrespect. So, disrespecting others in all of its forms is wrong Islamically. So, the authorities should understand this. You don't need to be arrogant. Become humble, the community will respect you and they put you in a position, you might not reach that position, but they will put you there. And one of the worst things that the, the authority is, is thinking about, and sometimes they don't think about this actually, uh, is that after they resign or they finish their responsibility, they come back to the community, they face what? A total rejection by the community. Kama tadinu, tudan. Kama tadinu, tudan. So they, they will receive a total rejection because people are, were respecting them simply because of their position. And now they lost this, then they come back to the normal life. People will not respect them in the way they, 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 they deserve, they used to deserve actually. But imagine if somebody is humble, even after they resign, people will maintain that respect to, to him. The same respect they used to give him, they are going to give him the same thing. Come to dinu, to dan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to truth. So, uh, brothers and sisters, let us uh, pay attention to this. Those of you who are in the, in the authority, you know, understand this concept uh, correctly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise you up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you a lot. You know, understand this uh, question. If you are a lecturer, if you are a teacher, if you are a modernist, if you are a sheikh, if you are a mufti, be the most humble person in the community. This is my advice uh, to all of us taking from the sunnah of the Rasulullah, sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which you found in words and in practice also. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa practiced this, you know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to truth. So, one of the punishments... Uh, for this pe person who is arrogant, when he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with him. And you know what anger means, right? Okay. قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن المصورين يعذبون يوم القيامة ويقال لهم أحيوا ما خلقت. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, مصورون. And it is a topic that people really 
and it always create things, you know. I don't know when, when are we going to stop, but it always create things, you know. And the hadiths of the Prophet are very strict. But desire is really, really, really uh, involved in this issue a lot, you know. So Rasulullah says, the image makers, those people who are making images and pictures, he says, they will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. وَيُقَالُ لَهُمْ أَحْيُوا مَا خَلَقْتُ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell them, أَحْيُوا مَا خَلَقْتُ Give life to that which you created. So if we stop here, it is more than enough. But uh, uh, I will just tell you what the scholar said. Get it? I will just tell you what the scholar said. So Ibrahim is just a narrator here, you know. Okay, the scholars divided uh, images into three categories. النحت. النحت is to bring a piece of wood or metal or hadid or iron or whatever and you cut it, you design a statue with it. Any living things. By the way, when we say living thing in the fiqh of Islam, living things uh, uh, is, is dealing with anything that has a soul in it. You get an idea, not just growing. No, it should be having a soul. Anything that has soul, you know, and it moves because of that. That's hayat uh, ruh, uh, they call it. So these are the living things that we, we concern with. And when the Prophet sallallahu talks about tasweer, he's talking about this one. Okay, I will tell you why do we believe that he's talking about this one. So, so human beings, uh, jinns, Okay, I don't want to mention angels. Okay, uh, nobody can open the door and say he's seen angels. There are some who says that. Okay, may Allah guide them. Okay, so human beings, any creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has soul, insects, birds, fish, animals, and what else I forgot. Okay, all of them. Get it? All of those ones that has, that 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 have uh, a soul. Okay, a person when you make a statue, you know, you take something and you design something like that looks like them. 100% by consensus of the scholars, to my knowledge, unless if this uh, consensus ijma is revoked. You know, nowadays I heard somebody also in a meeting saying that, why do we need to stick with the ijma of the scholars? We also can sit down and make our own ijma, you know. I was looking at him, you know. <laughs> you know I, I don't think his knowledge is, is equivalent to, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, the, the size of the, the teaspoon. But he's saying that those scholars, he doesn't agree with them, you know. Uh, he has to come back and he has a right to come back and sit down with his own people to revoke the ijma. Not knowing that in Islam, if ijma is established by the previous nation, this ijma cannot be revoked unless if this ijma is based on ijtihad. And the basis of this ijtihad changed, then the ijma could be, could be revoked. But ijma based on nuzuz, like they believe, all of them, the dhuhr prayer is wajib and it has to be prayed on the time, on the time Allah SWT fixes it. And then somebody will tell you that nowadays we can sit down also and make our own ijma to readjust, you know, to fit. Ramadan doesn't fit this year, you know, because we have so many jobs, you know. And uh, somebody tells us that uh, it's taking the capacity of human being and as such people shouldn't fast. All of these stupidities that we have heard in this life, you know, so ijma cannot be cannot be cannot be revoked so that is ijma that if somebody is to make this this person is included in this hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and many other hadith also so that's the first category to design something on, on this nature the second category is the one that you draw with your hand you make the shapes of the face you know the shape shape of the face okay this one also is included i don't i can't remember any scholar that take it out okay I can't remember any scholar among the scholars of Islam who, uh, Islam who takes this out. And a person is not allowed to do it. Okay? It will be included in this hadith. And we should, we should, we should understand. And some people will say this is hardship. No, as I said from the beginning, I'm just telling you what Rasulullah said. It is not, if it is only in one hadith, somebody might say something, which is also wrong. You know, even if it is in one hadith, we have to listen to Rasulullah but I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, I can narrate to you and hadith to cut to mutawatira. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi was talking about this, talking about this so many times, which shows that it is a serious matter. But unfortunately, nowadays, it is. We even have a competition on this matter. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa taala guide us. So that's the second category. The third category, which is uh, which is uh, uh, I mean the place where the controversy lies amongst the scholars. 
Many scholars said it is okay for a person to do it, and many other scholars said it is not okay. Uh, this is when you take uh, pictures with the, with the cameras. Many scholars said it's, it's okay. So these are the 80s of Ijtihad. You know, these are the 80s of Ijtihad. I call it a doubtful matter. Where the Prophet ﷺ advises in the hadith of An-Nu'man ibn Bashir, he says, stay away from the doubtful matters. It is better for you. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ are very general. Are very general. And uh, even if you happen to take... So, this doubtful matter, can a person do it? Yes, whenever you need it, do it. This is my proposal. When you don't need it, don't do it. When you need it, do it. But when you don't need, when you don't need it, stay away from it. It is better for you. I have no doubt in this. You need it for the passport. You need it for documentation. You need it for... Uh, what else? For the school, you know. Whenever there is a need, you know. Not necessity, whenever there is a need. Okay? They don't link it to the necessity. They said whenever there is a need, be it in light a person, that when he does it, there is no problem with that, inshallah. You get it? So these are the matters of, of doubt. You know, although you don't tell the person, uh, don't uh, do it if he believes it is okay. And inshallah, be it in light Allah, whoever is satisfied with the opinion of those scholars who said it is okay to take the pictures with the, with the camera, be it in light Allah, they will be responsible if that opinion is, okay, is not okay, but not him. He will be okay, but as long as uh, he must make sure that he's not following his desire. But as I said, doubtful matters, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of An-Nu'man ibn Bashir advised us when he says, Al-Halal bayin wa al-Haram bayin wa baynahuma umur mushtabihat fa man ittaqa al-shubhat istabra al-dinihi wa irdihi. He says, Halal is clear, Haram is clear, and there are doubtful matters between Halal and Haram. Whoever stays away from the doubtful matters, he will protect his honor and dignity and his religion. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded us and advised us to stay away from doubtful matters. You know, that's the best way. That's ihtiyat. That's called as called, uh, I mean, mentioned. So this is my advice to all of my brothers and sisters that make sure that you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not having any matters of doubt with you. You Allah. Just look at this life, of a temporary life. Although I know people find it so interesting when they sit down and... Uh, uh, take whatever they want but remember that we are not here to stay you know anything that has doubt stay away from it anything that has doubt in it stay away from from it do things which you don't have doubt in it which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear the doubtful matters ask the scholars you know until the time the doubt is removed but don't you ever go for something which uh, doubt exists in it the last issue concerning this matter is when you take the picture, uh, for instance, you believe that it is okay to have the pictures. When you have them, where do you keep them? Uh, this is also a good question to be asked. Uh, if you keep them at home, then you're going to lose a lot because angels don't come to the place uh, where pictures and images are. That's the hadith of Jibreel, uh, alayhi salam. And he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we the angels Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it prohibited upon us to get inside a house where there is there are images. And he, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, where, where, where is the image? He said, on the curtains of your wife. And for sure these images are drawings, you know. It's not a statue, it's not the object being fixed, no. And how do you know that they are drawings? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was advised by Jibreel to take the curtains and cut them into pieces in the way they would not look like images of living things. He said they would look like trees, they would look like rivers, they would look like uh, something else, but not uh, those kind of creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that have souls. That's the reason why we said living things in Sharia is referring to those ones which have, have souls. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whenever there is picture, we are not supposed to come in. So even if you have the pictures, you know, you take them according to the opinion. Because we have great scholars who say taking pictures with cameras is okay. You get it? Uh, taking pictures with cameras uh, uh, is okay. But even if you take it, then where to keep it? You know, the question remains, where to keep it? You keep it at home, you're going to lose a lot because the angels of mercy will not visit your house. So that means it is going to end of us a waste of, waste of time. So let's be very careful because these days and nowadays we are suffering from all of these matters of jinn, matters of shayateen, matters of so many things, you know. We have to be very careful. These things, they, they seem to be tiny 
Okay. But Islamically, they have a greater impact. Something that will stop Jibreel from entering the house, it is not tiny anymore. You should look at it like this. Something that stops Jibreel. Even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, he was waiting for Jibreel. He says, angels do not break their promise, you know. When he went out, he found Jibreel. Jibreel told him, I have been here. But I couldn't get in because uh, th th there is a picture on the curtains and we are not allowed to get inside a place where the pictures exist. You have two entities here, angels and, and, and shayateen. Either you have one with you or the other one will remain with you. So if the angels get out of the place, shayateen will be the replacement. So it's not for our own benefit. And uh, nowadays the epidemic is we have books uh, for our children and all of these things, you know. Uh, for the magazines and, uh, and, what, what is that? and the newspapers, this one we shouldn't have an excuse because you don't need to bring them to your house. Read and then get rid of them immediately. But the books for the children, in the light Allah, there is no problem because if you're going to cut the books, you know, the books will be destroyed. You know, there's every single page, it, the picture is there. So nothing you can do. But have a space in your house where you put the books. The place where your kids are sleeping, where you sleep, this should be away from images. You know, this should be away from from the images as much as you can, so that you can have a good sleep. Angels will be there, be even light ta'ala. Places where there is no images, angels will be there, insha'Allah ta'ala. So that's my advice and my proposal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good and help us to be, uh, I mean, living a very good and pleasant life in this life. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our, and our progeny. So these ones, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever is involved in making images, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, tell them, give life to that which you, which you create on the Day of Judgment. And you know they cannot do that, okay? Yeah, nobody can do that. وَفِيهَا أَيْضًا And in the Sahihain, أَيْضًا from Abdullah ibn Umar عَنِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ قَالَ إِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ إِذَا مَاتَ عُرِضَ عَلَيْهِ مَقْعَدُهُ بِالْقَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ إِنْ كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ فَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ وَإِنْ كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ فَمِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ فَيُقَالُ هَذَا مَقْعَدُكَ حَتَّى يَبْعَثَكَ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ صَلَى اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى أَنِي جَعَلْنَا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ Abdullah ibn Umar said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if one of you, when one of you dies, you know, and they put him in the grave, عُرِضَ عَلَيْهِ مَقْعَدُهُ بِالْغَدَاتُ وَالْعَشِي Subhanallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send the angels to uh, to, 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 to introduce, to tell you the, uh, I mean, to show you your place in Jannah. You know, if you are, if a person is from the people of Jannah, they will show him his place in Jannah. Morning and evening, you know, it's very interesting, you know, you will see your place, you know. If this person is from the people of Jannah, they will show him his place in Jannah. If this peop uh, person is from the people of hell, they will show, they will be showing him day and night, every day twice, his place in in that place, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect. They will tell him, This is your place. You know, they will present the place and put him, uh, they will present the place to him and tell him, This is your place until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrect, resurrect you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tawfiq. وفيه ما أيضا عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا صار أهل الجنة في الجنة وأهل النار في النار جِئَ بِالْمَوْتِ حَتَّى يُوقَفَ بَيْنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَالنَّارِ ثُمَّ يُذْبَحْ ثُمَّ يُنَادِي مُنَادٍ يَا أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ خُلُودٌ بِلَا مَوْتٍ فَلَا مَوْتٍ وَيَا أَهْلَ النَّارِ خُلُودٌ فَلَا مَوْتٍ فَيَزْدَادُ أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ فَرَحًا فَرَحًا إِلَى فَرَحِهِمْ وَيَزْدَادُ أَهْلُ النَّارِ حُزْنًا إِلَى حُزْنِهِمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ said on the day of judgment when the people of Jannah get inside Jannah جَعَلَنَا اللَّهُ وَإِيَّاكُمْ مِنْهُمْ وَأَهْلُ النَّارِ إِلَى النَّارِ And those people who are supposed to be taken to hell, they went to the hell. أَذَنَ اللَّهُ مِنْهَا جِئَ بِالْمَوْتِ Death will be brought. People will be settling in Jannah. Everyone is enjoying life. And then suddenly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask angels to bring death. You know, these are all iman bil ghayb, you know. That we're just supposed to submit, you know. Death will come in a physical form. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, they will be asked, Ya ahal al-jannah, hal ta'rifuna hadha? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa kulluhum qad ra'ahu. And all of them saw death. That means when a person is going to die, he will see death at that moment, you know. That's why he says, wa kulluhum qad ra'ahu. 
all of us, we, saw, we witnessed death. So the people of Jannah, they already saw death. And people of Nar also already saw death. So death will be brought on the day of judgment when everyone settled in his uh, position. Hatta yuqafa bayna al jannat wal nar. It will be placed between Jannah and an nar. Thumma yudbah. And then they will tell them, do you know this? They will say, yes, we know. Mahada, they will say, this is hadal maut. This is death. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the angel to slaughter death. Because it will come in a form of sheep, a ram. And then they will slaughter the death. Thumma yunadi munad. And then somebody will announce you know, to the people in Jannah and people in hell. Ya ahl al-Jannati khuludun falamaut. They will tell the people of Jannah, this marks the beginning of life which has no end you know, for you guys. Falamaut, you're going to remain forever with no death. And the people of hell also, they will be told the same thing. Khuludun falamaut. So what happened is after that, then the people of Jannah, they will in get an increase because what, what, what they might be afraid of is going out of Jannah. You know, after seeing all of this ni'mah, you know, they might be having the same uh, mentality of dunya, you know, that no matter how much you're enjoying a day will come, you will lose it, you know. And human beings uh, don't like this, you know. That's why shaitan managed to deceive Adam with this. You know, So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, will tell, will ask the angel to tell them that from now onward, there will be no death. So they will increase uh, their, their happiness. And the people of hell also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell them uh, through the angels, you will stay here and there will be no death. Of al Musnadi Anhu and Abdullah ibn Umar. قال من اشترى ثوبا بعشرة دراهم فيها درهم حرام لم يقبل الله له صلاة ما دام عليه. By the way, this narration is is weak. Okay, and also according to this uh, commentator, also is weak. Uh, the narration is weak, so uh, we don't take any ruling. But uh, this is what uh, somebody mentioned that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that whoever bought uh, cloth. You know, the, the hukum is haram, to, to use money, haram money to buy clothes for yourself, you know. If you get haram money to use it, you, the one who got it, is haram. Manishtara Thoban, whoever bought a piece of cloth, the asharat dirahim, with 10 dirhams. And uh, one of the dirahim is haram, haram dirham, he got it through, through the haram way. لَمْ يَقْبَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ صَلَاةً مَا عَلَيْهِ His prayer will never be accepted as long as he's praying in it. Whenever he prays in it, that prayer will be rejected. According to the best opinion uh, on these martyrs, these are two different uh, uh, separate entities. When a person uh, uh, usurped or confiscated something from another person without having the right to do so, and he prayed in it, he got the sin of that action, but at the same time, his prayer will be accepted as long as he fulfilled the conditions. But there is another also issue, which is, disrespecting the ibadah, you know, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a haram way. But the prayer, as long as he did it in, uh, in its form, you know, fulfilling the pillars and the arkan and the wajibat, the prayer will be accepted, inshallah ta'ala. So this hadith says his prayer will not be accepted as long as he is wearing it. ثم أدخل أسبعيه في أذنيه ثم قال ثم تا إلم أكن سمعت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقوله and then he put his, his hand, his fingers, to inside the ears, you know, towards his ears. And he said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the ears, these ears uh, deaf. Deaf is somebody who cannot hear, right? Uh, deaf. If I did not hear this hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Get it? So, it doesn't mean that the hadith is correct because this is the companion, you know, saying. This is what is said that the companion said. We have to check the chain first before that companion. If the chain is not authentic, then we will say that we don't agree that this companion also said it. And for sure, if we don't agree with the companion to be saying it, we also don't agree that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying it, unless if the hadith is narrated to us through a very authentic chain of narration. And Abdullah ibn Amr, and also in the Musnad from Abdullah ibn Amr, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
سكرا مرة واحدة فكأن ما كانت له الدنيا وما عليها فسولبها In this hadith which is uh, Hassan inshallah which is Hassan inshallah uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said man taraka salata sukran whoever stays away from, from prayer out of sukr drunkness you know he drank wine he became intoxicated you know so he he did not pray because of this one prayer only فَكَأَنَّ مَا كَانَتْ لَهُ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا عَلَيْهَا ثُمَّ سُلِيبَهَا as if this person the example of this person is the likeness of somebody who has the dunya and whatsoever is on the dunya every single thing on the dunya he has it ثُمَّ سُلِيبَهَا and then he lost it you have all the dunya and then you lost it subhanallah you know it's, it's one prayer is greater than this even rakata al-fajr rakata al-fajr this is wajib prayer right but even rakata al-fajr the, the one that is sunnah the sunnah that you pray before fajr the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said khairun min ad-dunya wa ma'aliha they are better than the dunya and whatsoever is on it wa man taraka as-salata sukran arba' maratin kana haqqan 'ala allah an yusqiyahu tinat al-khaba qila wa ma tinat al-khaba li ya rasulillah qala usaratu ahli an-nar ahli jahannam and whoever stops uh, praying Arba'a marratin, four times. And this person really deserved to be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way, in addition to whatever he receives in hell, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, feed him with tinatul khabar. This is usara to ahl jannam as we interpreted long ago. You know, is the pass, you know, that comes from uh, the, the people of hell. Okay, that's kind of water that is coming from the people of hell after they get burnt and roasted so it shows that a person shouldn't miss the prayer in his life and this prayer is your protection my brothers and sisters it protects in this life and it will protect you in the hereafter and said, whoever drank wine once in his life and he did not repent, you know. If he drank wine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept his prayer for 40 days. So one uh, drinking of wine can cause a person to lose his prayer for 40 days. And he has to pray. And he has to pray. Okay? But in tab tab Allah alayhi. If he re repents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. But in aada, lam yaqbal Allah lahu salatan arba'ina sabaha. If he comes back again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept his prayer for 40 days. And he has to pray. And it will be useless. Uh, if he repents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept his repentance bi idhnillah. The narrator says, I don't know whether in the third or the fourth the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "If he doesn't repent and he goes back to it after the repentance, you know, he really deserved to be fed with this osara to ahli ahli nah, that kind of water that is coming from the people of hell on the day of judgment." Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you can you can see why 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 you know and the way it smells. I don't know, but uh, and I, I never smell wine in my life, but. And whoever knows it before will tell us that you know there's no good in it you know and even looking at the consequence you know it is called what umul khabaith you know it is called umul khabaith and you know the story of that person who was given a choice by a woman right to choose whether to drink wine or to kill a baby or to commit zina with her drinking wine is too big for him and uh, because he will lose his aql you know and uh, committing zina is also bad. And killing the boy is really worse. He decided to drink wine and he drank the wine. What happens after drinking the wine? He killed the boy. He got it intoxicated and killed the boy and committed zina with the woman. You get it? So he said, the drinking wine, at least this is for me alone, you know. But committing zina, the sin extended to somebody else. 
So he drank the wine. And the effect comes, he committed zina with the woman and, and killed the boy also. So that you can understand that wine is umul khabait. In the subhanAllah, we heard stories mentioned by some of our scholars, you know. A person committed uh, a drunk wine and come back home and committed zina with his daughter. And she got a child. And she got a child. Now, how do we classify this child? Her brother, you know, at the same time, her son. And to him, his son and his what also? Grandson. You can see how wine is d d d making something maqloob, you know. We are told by a dhahabi about somebody who killed his mother, you know. He drank wine, he killed his mother. He burnt her, you know, he put her in a tanur. She died because of that. You know? So that's wine. There is no good in it at all. That's why Islam never compromised this. Never compromise this. And you can understand why Islam is blocking the way, you know. So many questions about, can we use perfume that has alcohol, medicine with alcohol? You know, you can imagine if we open this door, then how to close it, you know. Yes, you use it in a good way, but your brother is not using it in a good way. That's why, my dear brothers, and especially the student of knowledge amongst you, uh, take this uh, legal maxim mentioned by Sheikh Islam bin Taymiyyah. It's a very good legal maxim, you know, to be taken, you know and shared, shared with the authority. You know. They need to know this, you know. Al-Babu, إِذَا لَا يُمْكِنِ ضَبْتُهُ يُغْلَقُ جَمِيعُهُ Al-Babu, إِذَا لَا يُمْكِنِ ضَبْتُهُ يُغْلَقُ جَمِيعُهُ Al-Babu, إِذَا لَا يُمْكِنِ ضَبْتُهُ يُغْلَقُ جَمِيعُهُ It says any door that you cannot control, then that door has to be blocked. That's the principle we found in the Sharia. The door that cannot be con controlled, we block it. You know, open the door to the wine and see who will... That's the, the, the cigarette now. If the authority block it, it will not come. But if we allow it, and then we tell people, don't do, who will listen? Nobody. But block it, because you cannot control. You don't know who will do it and who will not do. The same goes to other things, you know, which are prohibited Islamically, you know. Even if you have certain circumstances where the permissibility is allowed, we, we have to remain, we have to maintain the at the block. We have to block them. So, Rasulullah told people that Allah SWT made wine prohibited. And he says, مَا أَسْكَرَ كَثِيرُهُ فَقَلِيلُهُ حَرَامُ Whatsoever intoxicated in a larger amount to take a drop of it also is prohibited Islamically. And he did an excellent job. You know, since the Prophet ﷺ informed the believers that wine is prohibited, it never came back to Medina in that way. You might have one or two people doing, but in that way, everyone, almost everyone is engaged in it. No, they stopped completely. SubhanAllah. One word from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That's why the enemies of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the deen, they were amazed, you know. They didn't know how to make something like this. They told us in the U.S., they tried to do something like this. They spent billions of dollars, according to what we have heard. It doesn't work. It brings more problem, actually, more than the way it was. Rasulullah did not spend one cent, and it worked. And they spent everything, and it doesn't work. Nothing can stop people except the divine revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us uh, good. So, brothers and sisters, uh, stay away from anything and advise whoever is known to be taking these things uh, to stay away from it, because it doesn't fit human beings. It doesn't fit human being. It takes a person from human nature to animal life. You Allah, to animal life. If you see somebody who is drunk, you know, he does all kinds of stupidities, you know. They told one of the companions, you take wine, he, that, that's long ago. He says, no. And how to live with aql. See, because it, that's before Islam, you know. Because it goes with the aql. So whatever affects the aql is rejected Islamically. So this wine, if a person is to take it, he will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way. وفي المسند أيضا من حديث أبي موسى قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من مات مدمنا للخمر سقاه الله من نهر الغوطة This hadith, by the way, is weak also. This hadith is weak. This hadith is weak. قيل وما نهر الغوطة قال نهر يجري من فروج من فروج المومسات يؤذي أهل النار ريح فروجهن. In this hadith, uh, it is mentioned that the Prophet said, "Whoever died, you know, uh, mudmin al-khamr, 
you know, a mood mean is somebody who is addicted to wine. You know. He died in that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will feed him with the, with the river of Ghuta. So they ask, what is the river of Ghuta? He says, this is the river that is pouring from the private parts of the prostitutes. Al-Mumisat. Okay? Prostitute. So it comes out from, from the uh, uh, and, uh, and the people of hell, you know, get harmed by it. Even stronger than the punishment in hell, they get harmed by this by this river when it comes to them. So this hadith is weak. We don't need it at all. There are other hadiths that talks about Osara to Ahl Nar. Those who are not authentic, we don't need this one. Okay. وفيه أيضا قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعرض الناس يوم القيامة ثلاث عرضات فأما فأما عرضتان فجدال ومعاذير وأما الثالثة فعند ذلك تطير الصحف في الأيد فأخذ بيمينه وأخذ بشماله. Okay, this hadith also is is uh, is weak uh, to my knowledge. Uh, but some scholars are saying uh, uh, it might be Mawquf on the companion, uh, he himself. But uh, what I know is uh, that the Senate is, is, not, is not authentic. Okay? Uh, in this hadith, uh, it is mentioned that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala present people on the Day of Judgment in three, three situations and three positions. Okay? And the first... Uh, situation the first uh, place is uh, the first two places okay uh, that people will be presented you know uh, it will be a jidal ma'adir argument this one did this, this one did that or ma'adir and excuses you know uh, the third one is when the the suhuf the books of record of the amal of ibadullah uh, azza they will come from the from the sky some people will take this with the right hand and some people will take this with the, with the left hand. There is another authentic hadith, okay, which Yugni and Hadha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was asked by Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Ya Rasulullah, on the day of judgment, are you going to remember your family members? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ya Aisha, as for uh, uh, in uh, three places, he says nobody will remember another person. People will keep remembering what is going on, but there are there will be three places where nobody will remember another person. Three places, three positions where nobody will remember another person. Uh, the first place is in the Tatayur Suhaf, when the Sahifa, the books of record, are coming falling from the sky. So Allah, that's a very critical moment, terrible moment, because you know that. The determination of your place is going to take place after the, the, the thing comes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, mm-hmm. Some will be taking their books with their, with their right hand. You know. And you have Some people will be taking their book from the left hand. So a person will be in, in a situation which uh, you can say he is not conscious. He is not conscious. You know, doesn't know what exactly is going on. You know, he doesn't think of anything. He's just concerned about that paper. Where is it going to be located? You know, said Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, look for tawfiq. That's the first place. The second uh, place is uh, when the scale is being fixed. And this is when the, the believer will not know what is going on, except the, 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 the sirat, you know. That's why it is really good to uh, adopt the, the, the advice of Umar radiallahu anhu when he says, Hasibu anfusakum qabla antu hasibu. Always judge yourself before this judgment. Was zinuha qabla antu zinu. And did you weigh yourself, you know, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring you on the day of judgment for, for the scale. And what is it going to be weighed? A person, according to the best opinion, a person himself and his deed, you know, and his deed. Both are going to be weighed. And this is ilmul ghaib, you know, something that is ghaibi. We don't argue, you know, there are some firqa, some aqidah that doesn't even agree that there is scale. They don't agree with that because they said, how can you weigh an abstract? How do you see the deed? They say, how can you weigh it? 
Subhanallah. All of these are happening when you don't agree to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't agree that you have a limited capacity to understand things, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is just sharing with us what we can comprehend. The rest is a test for us to believe or to reject. You know, the good believers will say what? Aman Nabi, kullum min Rabbina. They will say, we believe in the scale, you know, and in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it, and we believe it is going to happen. In the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. So we have to be very careful. And as I said, this is also a reminder for us to make sure that we eat halal. We eat halal. Stay away from riba. Stay away from bribe. Stay away from theft. Stay away from anything that is inappropriate. You know, don't you ever put in your stomach except that which you are sure that this is this is halal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect. The last place is when the sirat is Fix on the matni jahannam, on jahannam. When people are crossing the sirat, this is the worst uh, place uh, that is going to take uh, place. And since uh, it is going to come in the next uh, class, uh, the Prophet ﷺ will tell us what will happen when people are crossing the sirat. So I will not talk about this sirat, which is the worst place on the Day of Judgment. On the Day of Judgment, the worst moment is when people are crossing the sirat. You will never see a tragedy in your life like that. Sirat itself is just, just like, you know, imagine a bridge thinner than a hair. You know, pick up your hair if you have a long one. Just take it, take it and see. Sometimes if you don't have strong eyes, you don't see it properly. You know, so it is more thinner than that. You know, that means it's something maybe you need something to make it a bit bigger to see it. And it's a bridge that everyone has to cross. Okay, is that enough? No, it is not. Thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword. You know why you have the sharp in the sword? Because it's so thin. You make it so thin, so thin in a way that it becomes so sharp. When it is a bit thicker, it doesn't cut. So you make it so thin. So this one is so thin in a way it's sharper than the sword. And you know in this life, in those places where they cut... Uh, uh, the head of those people who committed something that necessitate assassination, death penalty. You know, those of us, those of us who watch the, the moment somebody was telling me he was watching, you know, long ago in Saudi Arabia, he was watching the person who is supposed to be killed. You know, the guy just came with a sword and he did not even gather his strength. You know, he just come and cut like this. And the head goes out. You can see this, this, uh, this uh, this uh, this sword is so sharp in a way, you know, it's just like that, you know. Some of them, they might not pick up blood that much, you know. That means so quick, you know. So, and the serat is sharper than a sword. Whatever sh sharp the sword has, the serat is sharper than it. Is that enough? No. Jahannam is under it. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Lam ara kal yawmi fil khayri wa shahr. Never saw something like, like what I saw today in good and it's also in evil. That's hell. You know, something that it eats itself because of evilness. So it is under the sirat and people can see it. Is that enough? No. At the side of the sirat you have the kalalib. We will talk about them, the hooks. To take whoever is commanded by Allah SWT to be taken. You know, even seeing them, you know, the way they're taking people, you know. Snatching people and getting them inside, inside hell. It's so scary, even if a person is going to pass, it's so scary, you know. And the place is completely dark. So, that will be the, the next uh, lesson, inshallah. We will talk about uh, the sirat in the next uh, class. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Before, and then, so these are the three places mentioned by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he said, people will not be able to think about anyone. But other than that, a person might remember some of his his family, family members. Okay, the last hadith for today is the hadith of uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in the Musnad. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, Iyakum wa muhaqqarat al-dhunub. Fa'innahunna yajtami'ana ala al-rajul hatta yuhlikna'hu. Wa dharaba lahunna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mathalan, ka mathali qawmin nazalu arda fa ardan falatin. فحضر سنيع القوم فجعل الرجل ينطلق فيجيء بالعود والرجل يجيء بالعود حتى جمعوا سوادا وأججوا نارا فأنضجوا ما قذفوه فيها
Subhanallah. Rasulullah said, I warned you from those sins that people are belittling. The minor sins that we belittle. The Prophet said, you should be very careful. Because usually these uh, sins, they will, be, they will be gathered, you know. They will be gathered until they destroy a person. Minus in here, minus in here, minus in here. They will be gathered until the person get, get destroyed. To get idea, just like the way that people, if you have a small fire, that it might not be able to burn and to cook what you're looking, what you're trying to cook. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, the likeness of that person is just like the, the the people. They have something they want to cook, but the fire is not enough. So they reach a place which is empty, you know, you know, no life in it. And then the the the, the people who know how to do uh, how to uh, make the fire, uh, a person will go and bring you a piece of wood, and another person will bring another one, and they will come and get and make enough wood, and then they will make the fire. They will be able to cook whatever they put inside. So that's how the noob, they kept on gathering, 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 and they destroyed that person, you know. SubhanAllah. So we have to be very careful, you know. Don't just say, no, I'm not committing the major sin. That's just a minor sin. No, they're not just a minor sin. Walqatru minhu tadafakul khiljan. You know, the Khalij, right? The Gulf, uh, the river, you know. Qatar, you know, you don't see the drop of water. If it keeps coming, a day will come, this water will be, will be Khalij. Will be, will be what? Will be a river, you know. Will be acting like a sea. So these are the minor sins. If a person is not careful, they will, uh, I mean, I mean, keep increasing, keep increasing until uh, the time this person get get destroyed. May Allah subhanahu wa taala grant us good and protect us from uh, from any evil and grant us ability to repent whenever we commit we commit sin. So that's uh, all for today, inshallah, uh, on uh, what is that? Thursday, the evening light ta'ala, we'll come back to uh, uh, complete. I think we are almost done with this uh, chapter. And then uh, we go to uh, the next one, the evening light ta'ala. And uh, sorry, our host today, Abdurrahman, is on a journey, so pray for him. Uh, uh, he couldn't uh, uh, use the link we are using. And inshallah, we hope he will come back before Thursday. Then we will go back to our normal link, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. So we are then, let's uh, listen to the question and answers, uh, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakum Allah Can they hear me properly? I think they can hear, inshallah. Okay. A question from uh, Sayyid Iftikar. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. How do we practically balance between being assertive without being arrogant and being humble. When one is good, nice and humble, the society, the way it is today, the person is oppressed, disrespected and cheated. For example, in business, family life, etc. Jazakumullah khair. You mean how do we balance between humbleness and protecting ourselves from being cheated? Yeah. Uh, there is no contradiction at all. At all there is no contradiction. As a businessman, I protect my side. I block uh, the means uh, that somebody can cheat me. But it doesn't mean I'm arrogant. You smile. But don't let somebody cheat you. Humbleness doesn't mean that whoever uh, comes to you and then let him go and smack you in the way he wants. No, that's not humbleness. Humbleness is to be smart and to, to not to raise up your head, you know, but to look for your right with humbleness and humility. But not to submit you know, and let somebody take you right just like that. No, that's not humbleness. You get it? So there is no contradiction at all. You protect your right, you follow Sharia, follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in terms of preservation of right. You protect your right, you look for your right, but don't be arrogant, you know. Don't be, don't be arrogant. Okay? Uh, as I said, there is no contradiction at all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the truth. Okay, second question from Hiba. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How can ijma' be based on ijtihad? Uh, it might be an issue, uh, uh, Hiba. Let's say there is, there is something that happened in the Muslim community which uh, we couldn't find something specifically being mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So the scholars will sit down to decide. Do you get it? So the scholars sit down and decide, and they come up with unanimous, you know, uh, uh, conclusion, which uh, they unanimously agree that the hukum should be this prohibition, for instance. You know, so this is what we meant by ijma based on ijtihad. They will say that yes, it is prohibited. You know, all of them said that. You know, and uh, let's say in Malaysia, all the scholars in Malaysia, we go in Saudi also, all the Saudi scholars, we go to Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, and, and Africa, every single European, if they have scholars, they have scholars there. Okay, anyway, uh, in the in the European countries also, every single scholar we touch they will tell you the same thing. So you can say that, yes, ijma of the scholars of this contemporary era, that this thing is prohibited. Do you get an idea? Next generation, you know, after like 100 years, that means we are gone most likely. Okay? After 100 years, new generation came, and the scholars sit down, you know, honest scholars, they sit down, they see that, the basis of the ijtihad, you know, on that matter now changed because the issue now changed. Some ingredients were added, you know, in it. They're going to come up with another ruling, you know, to fit the nature of what people are doing. That's why uh, uh, Umar ibn Abdulaziz said, تَحْدُثُ لِلنَّاسِ أَوْ تُحْدَثُ لِلنَّاسِ أَقْضِيَةٌ بِقَدْرِ مَا أَحْدَثُهُ مِنَ الْفُجُورِ You know, the authority might be in need of introducing new law you know, in accordance to the, I mean, to, to address the new crime people introduce. These crimes, they might be there, but they are not in the way they are nowadays. Then the scholars, they have to come up with something also to meet those new ingredients being addressed, by the, being introduced by the people. That's why Umar, عنه, in the time of Rasulullah, something used to be like this. Like uh, when somebody drank wine, they beat him how many times? Forty times. But in time of Umar, two years also in the first two years in the life of Umar, it was also 40. Around 40 lashes. But Umar said, it, it looks like uh, people are making this because people increased the, the, the drinking of the wine. In the time of the Prophet, just fulan wa illan. But now people are drinking, you know. They come back, Umar said, we're going to take action. He combined the companions and he sat down with them they, com they uh, unanimously agree that the punishment could be increased, you know. I guess Ali ibn Abi Talib was the one who was proposing that this man, when he drinks, he got drunk and then accused people falsely and commit qadv. So we should beat him according to the qadv punishment. So that's why Umar go to 80 lashes, like the qadv punishment. And it wasn't there in the time of the Rasulullah But he was doing that to address, not changing the hukum, no, but to address this new thing that people brought, which wasn't there in the time of Rasulullah In the time of Rasulullah they don't have these stupidities where a person says to his wife, he divorced her 100 times. But during the time of Umar, people started changing, you know. Not in the companions of the Prophet but the new generation came, you know. Started changing. A person will tell his wife, he divorced her 100 times. Somebody told Abdullah ibn Abbas he divorced his wife 100 times. He said, take it easy. We need only three, you know. Keep the rest. Maybe. You know, he did not say that, but it, it means keep the rest for, maybe you will need it for reference in the future, but we just need only three. You know. So Umar said, Ara anna nasa qad ta'ajjalu fi shay'in kanat lahum fihi ana falaw amdaynahu alayhim. They started holding a person accountable of what he said. If he says he divorces his wife three times at once, Umar said, she will go away from you. She cannot come back to you until she marries somebody else. So this is the new law that was introduced and accepted by those people who were with Umar in those days, you know, to address the new attitude people brought to the, to the community. Not changing the law of Allah SWT. It remains in the way it is. You know, that's why Ali bin Abi Talib says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam beat a person 40 times, Abu Bakr 40 times, and two years, the first two years of the life of Umar also 40 times, and Umar did uh, beat a person 80 times, and Uthman, he says, al uh, he says, al kullu sunnah, he says, both are sunnah. Wal arba'una ahabu ilayya. And he says, 40 is more beloved to me. I will go with 40. This is his, his own, this, during his own time. To get an idea. So most likely people also uh, maybe reduce the amount of the uh, drinking, the wine they are doing. That's why he said, I will just restrict myself to, to 40. So I guess uh, Hiba is, is now clear to you, inshallah.
Yes, sir. Uh, question from Yusuf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. How do I get rid of old comic books? Is it enough to just keep it in a box and seal it away? Or is it best to get rid of them? If the best option is to get rid of them, can I sell them or donate them or should I burn them? Uh, whatever th these books are, I don't know them, but uh, what is that? Comic books. It has a lot of pictures. Uh, pictures in, in it. Any book that it is not, uh, you don't need it. You know, I advise you with this general advice. Any book which has a lot of pictures which you don't need, don't keep it in your house. Take it out. And uh, if there is somebody who needs it for his school, if it is a school book, that is a need. Give it to somebody who needs it to make use of it. To get an idea. But those books which you don't have need in them and uh, they have pictures, I advise you to get rid of them. Uh, just throw them away. If they contain ayat and some Quran and uh, uh, something in them, burn them. You know, burn, burn them, inshallah. But don't. Don't sell because whatever you cannot use, you cannot give it to anyone and you cannot sell it also at the same time. Get it? Unless if you are selling to somebody who is permitted to use it. But when it comes to these matters, nobody is allowed to use it, even the non Muslim. Because non Muslims also, according to the best opinion, are not supposed to go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Get idea? So one of the things that took them to hell, it is because they don't practice the, the deen. Not just iman, but they just don't practice any. So the deen, if they practice it, will not be accepted because, uh, will not be accepted because they don't have the, the pillar. They don't have the base for it. Ibn Asim al-Gharnati wa bittifaqin qati'u al-burhani an khutib al-kuffaru bil-imani li yahsul al-takrifu bil-mashru'i fi haqqihim min sa'il al-furu'i. وحد وأنهم ليسوا بمقبول العمل حتى يرى الإيمان منهم قد حصل. so he says the consensus of the scholars that kuffar are supposed to accept they are supposed to accept Islam and iman. all of them Allah subhanahu wa taala commanded them to accept the truth. you know so why is that so that the other rituals you know the other details of the ibadah the caliph of Sharia will be accepted when they do it. Otherwise, it will be useless, and they have to do it. If they don't do it, the punishment will be, will be doubled. Okay? So if, if there is something which is haram, you don't pass it to a non-Muslim to do it. Okay? Somebody told me he's selling something that is haram. You know, I told him not to do it. He said, but he's selling to the Western community. I said, yeah, still you can do that. He said, but uh, it, it should be okay, because let them go and get destroyed. You know? <laughs> they get the idea, but this justification is wrong. You know, Islam says no is no. Okay, when it is no, it is no. Okay, you don't do it with anyone, neither Muslim nor uh, others. Okay. Allah guide us to truth. Uh, question from Sister Hazliza. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Should studying at a library which has books with living things photos and also posters of living things be avoided? Uh, should posters? Should studying at a library which has books with photos of living things as well as posters? Be avoided, and you should be avoid studying in such a place. Uh, if you have another place, then it's better for you to stay away from any th any place with images. But if you don't have any other place, inshallah, it will not affect you. Eden light, Allah, especially offices and Eden light, I will not affect you, inshallah. But the house, your house, take care of your house properly. That's it. Question from Abu Bakr in Al Wiqaya, I think it's the name of a book. Oh, okay. Is the text of recitation of Ayat al Kursi seven times and Surah al Fatiha seven times for cure Sahih? I don't know the number of. They mentioned seven times about Fatiha, but uh, it, it, to be established in the hadith of the Prophet, وسلم, I can't remember a hadith for Surah. For Ayat al Kursi, I have never heard of something like this. But with Fatiha, some scholars have mentioned this. I guess even Hajar has something on this matter. His second uh, they, sometimes they are used in Qiyas because the Prophet also in many places, especially when it comes to health, he talks about seven, you know, Sab'a, Sab'a Qirab, that he, he asked them to bring those uh, bucket of water, that he mentioned seven. So seven, 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 that's why they might, uh, they put the seven in Surah al Fatiha also. But for I to proceed to fix it seven times, and to attribute it to Sharia, I don't know where it is established. 
even with Surah Al-Fatiha. Seven times, I cannot remember any place where the Prophet ﷺ advised us for Ruqya to recite Fatiha seven times. But is it Ruqya? Yes, it's Ruqya. We can read it any times we want. And if you read it seven times, it's okay. But don't say Rasulullah said it. Okay, Abu Bakr, second question. Sheikh, sometimes in uh, IT school projects documentation, one may need to attach a screenshot of some portions of the project which might have faces in them. The screenshots are to prove that the application is working. Is this permissible? For example, a video chat application. Mm. Uh, again, uh, Khalid, I missed a uh, loss. In IT school projects documentation, sometimes we need to attach screenshots of some portions of the project which might have faces in them. These are to prove that the application is working. Is this permissible? For example, no, insha video chat. In, inshallah, in light Allah, inshallah, I hope. That is not whenever a person needs, and there is no problem in these things, inshallah. The point is just to do it for fun with no need. But whenever there is a need, be it in light Allah, there is no problem in it. Question from Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Am I supposed to avoid toys with faces for kids? If not, how should I keep them? I was avoiding this actually intentionally, but. <laughs> Uh, I, I, when I was talking about it, it came to my mind. I, then I said, okay, let me just save myself and keep quiet, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we talk about this a lot. And these are the toys for the kids. You know, the scholars are a bit sensitive. The one who we can buy a toy with, uh, with a face uh, or a toy of a, a human being is only a girl. Some scholars said this girl has to be Yatima. Yatima means Faqidat uh, al she lost her, her father uh, that because of the mercy that Allah SWT asked us to show on her if she requests uh, then we go for that so I'm just trying to tell you how much uh, to what extent the scholars discuss uh, this matter okay uh, but generally the question is can we have it we can have it only for the for the girl you have a daughter uh, a boy no this is not permissible to have it with the boys. And what are we supposed to have with the boys? This is also a question mark uh, and a matter of discussion amongst the scholars. Some scholars said you can have a dumya, a baby, but it shouldn't have. Whatever opinion you are taking, the question is, is uh, I mean, the, the thing you have to understand is it shouldn't have the precise feature of a human being. Okay? Precise feature of a human being. This one, to my knowledge, is, is rejected by the scholars. You get an idea of precise features of human being. And uh, also, as Ibn Uthameen and some other scholars have mentioned, when it talks or it dance in the way we have the babies nowadays, the dolls nowadays, they dance, they talk, and sometimes they sing haram things, actually. We're giving it to our, our kids. You know. As I said, I heard uh, a doll. And this one, I visited a museum in Medina. Uh, they have it in Hayat al-Amra, Ruben al-Munkar. They show us uh, a doll. And that the music that the doll is singing is ka kafirun bi kitabillah, you know. Your child remember this kafirun bi kitabillah, you know, throughout his life, you know. Kafir bi kitabillah, kafir bi something. Uh, all of those, uh, I mean, some of these pillars of Islam, this is what your son is. You might say, but this is stupidity, but you know, kids is not to them, you know. And f you might be uh, fighting, you know, them to remove this in the future on them. So, so these are the things that we, sh we have to observe. That's why many scholars said that the, the banat that Aisha used to use, they are not actually, they are not actually dolls. They are something ala shakli salib, something that is in the form of a cross, you know, that's just like the piece of cotton. You know, that way some kids, when they don't have money to buy, they just have those kind of uh, symbolic uh, babies. You know. So they said it is, it is like that. So my advice to a parent is, you know, we have cases of uh, jinn, you know, and those dolls in the house, they have impact in it. Cases of jinn and those dolls in the house, they have impact in it. You know, so things that uh, nobody wants to hear. So uh, 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 try your best, especially in this contemporary era. I, kids, I, don't, I don't think kids, they are not even, I, I don't think kids are even interested in these things that much, you know. So we have a lot of alternatives. A lot of alternatives in the marketplace. Let them go, get, get those alternatives which are purely halal for them, you know, and uh, get something which is not precisely dis, uh, prescribed. I mean, describing a human uh, features. Even if you get a doll, but uh, remove the face. You know.
when the face is gone, then there is no picture anymore, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the surah to fi fil wajh. When the face is gone, then there is no uh, uh, image anymore. That's why some scholars said you can only buy the one that you cut off the head, but at least uh, destroy the face. You know, when there is no face, the rest of the the body will be useless, inshallah. Then uh, it will be okay, inshallah. It will not prevent angels from coming to the house. So what I'm trying to say is, although there are some scholars who said it is okay to have the baby even with the with the doll with the faces, but you have a lot of other scholars in the past who said it is not okay. Get it? So uh, the least you can say concerning this matter is a doubtful matter that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, uh, uh, stay away from from it, inshallah. But if you happen to buy the baby, uh, take away the face, okay? Remove the face. Even if you keep the head, but remove the face. Okay? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us the truth. Question from Sister Maryam. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhs. If we have books with photos and we either tear them out of the books or scribble upon their faces to blot them out, is it okay to keep them then? Yes, it's okay, inshallah. You get a lot of job, you know, we used to do that at home, but... Uh, uh, it worries our kids when they go to the school, people laugh a lot. The, the book and the teachers also make fun of them, so... Uh, uh, but it's okay. It's okay to do that. It's okay to do that. But some books, you cannot do it, because you're going to cover the whole book then. So as I said, those you can cover the pictures, because sometimes some of the images that they are giving our kids, they're so bad, you know, so bad. That's why going to conventional school is not a good idea at all, unless if a person doesn't have option. And I don't know when does that happen, because uh, you can just teach them at home. Homeschooling is always an option. You know? uh, I, I know school that uh, the, 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 the history you know, in grade 8 is all about the history of the, the, the British, British history. And subhanAllah, that book... You know, I happen to know that because I was told to teach that. I was billah. That book is from A to Z. It's nothing except discussion of the clashes of Christian, you know, Christianity. From A to Z. You know. So we have schools, alhamdulillah, in the history, they teach history of Islam. When I see that, so it's, I was so happy, you know. Because history is history. Why can't you learn the, learn the history of your country? Why do you need to learn the history of other people's uh, country? You know that shouldn't be studied in the school. A person should go and study it uh, separately. You know, learn the history of your country. If you don't want to learn the history of Islam, but let you learn the history of your country. Don't go to anyone, anywhere. You know, but as Islamic school, as a Muslim, we need to learn the history of Islam. That's the most important thing for kids to know, you know the history of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to truth. So it's okay, be it in Allah ta'ala. There is nothing wrong with that, inshallah. Question from Sister Rifa. What's the ruling of unicorn images on children's things, since the unicorn is not a real animal? So it's a unicorn, dragons. No, the point is, do not draw something that has features of human beings or have images with the features of uh, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which have soul in them. In which when a person sees it, you know that, yeah, this is this, you know. Do you get an idea? When he sees the face, he can recognize that this is this and that. Mm. Allah guide us to truth. But the other things which doesn't, don't show, or it sh you can recognize that this is a crocodile, but there is no face at all. Inshallah, it doesn't affect. Or this is a tiger, but there is no face. Uh, it doesn't affect the, uh, a person, inshallah. Mm. Sister Rifa, second question. And what about images on diapers? baby diapers? Uh, it shouldn't, shouldn't happen. You know, some scholars will say it's okay. Most of the scholars will say it's okay because they are disrespected. The child will poop on them. But Sheikh Nasser says it's not okay. You know, because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jibreel told him, uh, you must, uh, you cut it, cut the images, Jibreel said. So, but most of the scholars said if you are, uh, what do you call, disrespecting the images where you step on them. And this, uh, the one when the baby is in the most, the peak of disrespect because the, the baby poop and pee in, in it. You know. So inshallah, if you, if you find some, something without images, it's okay. But if you couldn't find, uh, inshallah, it's, uh, I mean, it is better to go and look for something without images. Uh, but if you couldn't find then the one with images, uh, inshallah, it's okay, be it like Allah, because these are neat. You know. These are neat, inshallah. 
Uh, the same goes to the tissues. Uh, the tissues, sometimes you find uh, images, inappropriate images also on them, even appropriate one. As long as image is image, but there are others with no image, just the name of the company and some design, that's better for a person to go for it. Yeah. Question from Sister Maryam. Sheikh, if the wali of the family or the men folk earn haram money, the women folk admonish them for it, but at the same time use that money because they cannot go out and earn. Are they sinful for it? Can they use as much as they need beyond the basic necessities from that haram money, or must they stick to spending on only what they need? Only what they need. Only what they need. Because he might have some other sources. He might have some other sources. You should keep advising him, and they take only that, what they need. Whenever they don't need, they should go and look for uh, money from somewhere else. Whenever they don't, uh, they don't need it, I mean, they have uh, the source, they should go and look for uh, the, the, what do you call, expensi ex expenses from other, other sources, inshallah. May Allah grant us good. That's why there should be a strong cooperation between husband and wife. When she knows that the husband is getting money from everywhere, she should really beg him. And she should exercise patience. She should tell him that we can be patient with anything. Anything that can help us to survive. Even if we're going to eat a piece of bread with water every day, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, but we're getting halal. Ah, intahayna min al-as'ila. Okay, then. Alhamdulillah. Okay, jazakum Allah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in you and your life. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you good and success in life. Innahu bi kulli jameelin kafeel. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.